A very good morning to you all. I am Dr. Hohoi from the Department of Political Science. Welcome you all to the first uh, postgraduate convocation ceremony of the college. Uh, I begin the convocation ceremony with a very popular quote, which is, uh, graduation is not the end, it's the beginning. And uh, it is a, a real privilege and an honor to host this special event for celebrating the uh, two years of rigorous hard work and dedication of our postgraduate students of political science and English. So, uh, to begin this ceremony, I would uh, request uh, our principal ma'am, the com commencement speaker, Dean of Social Science, Dr. Tem Sukumla, and the HOD of English, Dr. Rosie Tet, for the uh, tradition of watering of the Tree of Hope. The graduating batch of the postgraduating batch of 2023 found the strength to persevere, to believe in their abilities, and to view each hurdle as a chance to learn, adapt, and triumph in the field of studies for two rigorous years. Uh, it is hoped that encourage the, the postgraduates here today to chart their own course to think innovatively and to dare to dream, big as the college has always pursued each of us to strive for excellence as its motto. The tree of hope that we see here today will therefore be planted in the college campus in commemoration of your batch of 2023. Uh, now, now I call upon Dr. Puchong Tai for the prayers of blessing. May we please take your time. Let's take this moment of prayer. Almighty Heavenly Father, we give you all glory and honor for who you are and what you are to us. Lord, you have been so good to us all throughout the semester, and today this is truly a day of celebration for us. At this moment, we come before you with our open hearts and pray that your unfailing love shall be continued to be in this institution. Your unfailing love shall be continued to be with the teaching staff, the non-teaching staff, and to be with each and every student of this college. We pray for the graduates who are here this morning. May you continue to give them the knowledge and wisdom in mind from above. May you give them the strength to do their best, and most importantly, Lord, give them the hope and faith to guide them wherever they go and whatever they do. We also remember students who are not here today and who could not make it this time. Lord, may you give them the courage, strength, the good health, so that they will glorify your name through their success. I also pray for the short events today, Lord, and invite your Holy Spirit in our midst and help us to place to all the participants. We commit everything, our life, and your loving care. In Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Puchong. Uh, may the grace of God be always be upon us, and we are always grateful for all the good things that is around us. Now, uh, I want to take the honor of introducing the commencement speaker for this event, Dr. Yan Beni Yantan, Beni Sumer Yantan. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the Center for Naga Tribal Language Studies, Naga University. Her area of study includes oral tradition of the Nagas, folklore, vernacular literature, the study of language and culture, and critical theory. Her poetry, essays, and reviews have been featured in various national and international spaces, such as Riot, the Bombay Literary Magazine, Muse India, Outlook, Telangana, East Mosul, Sapiens, the Bangalore Literature Review, among others. She has also contributed writing to various anthologies and collections. She has also served as an assistant professor in the Department of English at the College. Also, I would like to uh, um, say that she is also the co-editor of the Anglo-Naga language dictionaries 
in particular Anglo Lotha Sumi uh, Palm Yimking so far, funded by uh, Tribal Research Institute, Directorate of Art and Culture, Kohima. Uh, Ma'am, we are extremely delighted and honored to have you here with us in this momentous journey of our lives. We welcome you all. We welcome you to this college for this auspicious occasion. Now, for the uh, for the next, uh, we go on to the next one. We will have a college and tent and uh, uh, plate. For this, uh, I ask all of you to rise up from your seats. Ma'am, you may please stay back for the principal's address.
Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Respected Chairperson, our Honorable Commencement Speaker, Dr. Yanbeni Yantang, Assistant Professor from the Center for Naga Tribal Language Studies, Nagaland University, parents, guardians, students, and staff who are present here this morning. I warmly welcome you all to the PG Convocation Ceremony 2023 for the School of English and Political Studies. We are so proud of our students who have made it this far and gone through two years of rigorous study at Tetsuo College to be graduating this year. And before I proceed any further, I'd like to give thanks to God for allowing us to witness this important occasion, for allowing us to witness the graduation of our students, and for us to be able to gather in this manner this morning to observe this special day. The success of our students today is the success of the entire Tetsuo College community and all of its stakeholders, which includes the parents, the families, the guardians, all past and present teachers, everyone who has been a part of molding our students into the person that they are as they sit here this morning. So we thank every one of you for being a part of molding and shaping these student lives. And I'd like to especially thank Dr. Yan Beni Yantan for agreeing to come here and address our graduating batch of students. First and foremost, Dr. Yan Beni Yantan is a good friend of mine. She is an intellectual. She is a prolific writer. And of course, she is an assistant professor at the Center for Naga Tribal Language Studies at Nagala University. Our chairperson has already introduced her to us, but they have been doing amazing work by bringing up publications, dictionaries, studying Naga languages, and so much more. So we appreciate Dr. Yanbeni for taking out the time to be here this morning, and we really look forward to hearing your address to the students. For this PG batch, for the class of 2023, we have 21 graduates from the Departments of English and Political Science. 13 of them are from the English program and eight students from the Political Science program. This morning, I would like to just share a few words to our graduating badge before we send you out into the world. Last month, we witnessed the graduation of 521 UG students, and I told them the same thing. So I'm gonna re reiterate what I mentioned to them last month. The first thing is that the Tetsuo College degree cannot be simply bought. It is a degree that is earned through the hard work, through the efforts and the sacrifices that you have all put in to make it this far. It is also a degree that is meant to give you greater confidence, but not arrogance. A degree that is meant to make you feel wiser, but also kinder and more humble and more sensible individuals who will know how to make better decisions and who will know how to stand up for what is right. And most importantly, who will know how to have an even greater thirst and curiosity to continuously exploring the world around you and learning. And I say continuously because Learning never ends. It does not stop here with your degree. It continues on until we all grow old. All of us 
teachers, students, parents are learning every single day. And that is exactly what we mean by striving for excellence. And I believe that all of you will carry forward the mission and vision of Tetsuo College, which is to empower yourself and the people around you towards lifelong excellence so that you can all go out and create a positive impact in this world. Life is short and life is very unpredictable. One moment you may be sitting comfortably at the top and the next moment you may find yourself at rock bottom. No one but God knows our future. But what can we do at the most? At the most, we can live our life to the fullest extent with every single day that we have. Please use this one lifetime that you have to explore everything at a deeper level. Questions of who you truly are, what you would like to be, and how do you want to contribute meaningfully with the life that you've been given? You will now be our alumni, and we hope that you will continue to keep in, in touch with your teachers, with the college. We have great expectations for you to become leaders in our society, and we hope to be meeting you and acknowledging you as the Tso alumni who have gone on, as I mentioned, to create this great impact in our society. So on this note, I would just like to conclude by wishing you all the very best. I wish you all a very bright and prosperous future ahead. And lastly, please do continue to keep in touch with the college and reach out to us, visit us, and do let us know what you're up to because we will always be more than happy to hear from you, not only hear from you, to work with you someday here at Tetsuo College. Thank you very much. Now, with great pride, I now introduce our valedictorian for today's event, Ms. Binuke Sama. Uh, I look into her brief uh, educational background. Uh, she completed high school from Regimental School Kohima with a score of 74%. Her higher secondary from Mount Harbun Kohima with a score of 86%. Uh, she was placed amongst the top 20 by the Nagaland Board of School Education. She completed her graduation from Kohima College. She joined Tetsu College in 2021 in the Department of Political Science. Uh, her CGPA score uh, is 7.44. She's the topper in political science from the college. Uh, now I may I call upon Ms. Bina to come up to the stage and uh, give her valid, valid, valedictory speech. A very good morning to you all, respected principal Dr. Hewa Sayalkin, our commencement speaker, Dr. Yandini Yantan, director, dean, each of these professors of respected department, all the esteemed guests, families, and my friends. Formally, I want to extend my greatest gratitude to our own Medica and also congratulate all my fellow successful postgraduates. Today, as I stand here as a valedictorian student, I feel very honored and privileged and is overwhelmed to convey my sincere regards and gratitude towards the position I stand. I'm Binu Sama from the Department of Political Science, skill UA 7.44 CGPA, postgraduate of 2023. Indeed, political science is a subject itself, varying from its concept to the theories of philosopher, was not an easy read for me as well. However, understanding the subject matter, emphasizing and analyzing within has helped me to score better grades. Well, my road to success is in fact an outcome of dedications, as I do not matter the hours invested 
but the quality of knowledge. From manifesting for just a past month to a topper has been through my hard work, keeping the consistency along with smart work. I remember myself once pondering if people could do it, why cannot I? And today, I am glad to stand here, proving that there is always a room of success through dedications and hard work. As Helen Keller says, optimism is a faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. However, it is also an undeniable fact that the college has been very helpful not only in nurturing and grading the students, but also to develop broader knowledge through seminars, workshops, co-curriculum, and so forth. The college also provided fields and opportunities for combined interaction classes, presentations, internships, exertions, authentic library, and as such, which has been a useful tool for developing my learning process and experience. Further, I would also like to make a few appraisals Firstly, I extend my gratitude to Tefso College for organizing this wonderful event and a note of appreciation for all the presenters present here today. Secondly, I owe my overwhelming gratitude to all the professors of Tefso College, especially to the political science department, who has sparkled not only the knowledge of syllabus, but also personally guided me whenever needed. Thirdly, I'm very pleased and thankful to my parents, my brother, and my friends who have immensely supported me to make these two years of journey a success. As a growing student, I always aspire to be a professor, and today I'm honored that I'm on its path. This success has in fact prepared me for what I would like to be, and I'm always passionate about teaching. Further, I would also like to encourage and convey a short message to my juniors to have a strong determination work hard and be goal oriented. For has every good consequences, there must be a consistency. Lastly, I wish a successful interview to all my fellow mates. Though our ways may part here, but a beautiful beginning awaits at the another door for each one of us. Thank you, strike for excellence. I'm sorry, Miss Bigger, you have to come back to accept your token of appreciation from us. To do this honor, I call upon uh, the Dean of Social Science, Dr. Temsu Kumla. Now, coming to the most awaited part of the event, uh, which is the award of degree, uh, which is to be conducted uh, by Dr. Rosie Tept, Head of the Department of English. So I ask her to come off the stage to begin the commencement process. Greetings everyone. First of all, I convey my heartfelt congratulations to the, cl the graduating class of 2023 on this significant accomplishment. We believe in your potential and we look forward to witnessing your continued success. For the commencement exercises, I request Dr. Yanbin Yantan, our commencement speaker, to kindly do the honors. graduating class of 2023 as you step forward to receive your hand hard-earned degree certificates remember that this represents not only the culmination of your academic endeavors but also the beginning of a new chapter in your lives each certificate signifies your dedication your perseverance and commitment to excellence 
The following students have been assessed and evaluated by Tetsu College and Narnia University and are hereby being awarded the postgraduate degree in arts in English and political science, respectively. Beginning with political science, as I call out your name, please come on stage and receive your degree. Binu K. Sangma. Pianro Niti Shidri. Sevotole Rako. Mulanulu as Vanna. Continuing with MA English, we begin with Akum Soba Longjar, Betonika Al Chishi, Amekali H. Yepto. Sope la sushi. Muamen la. Lovey body jimo. Na ke aye lima kamla pongen el yabang sang la inchen. Kilamiala Kichu and Imlitola Bongen. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I now kindly request Dr. Yambini Yantan, our commencement speaker, to take over the time and address the audience with her insights and wisdom with the gathered assembly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, respected Chair, uh, Dr. S. Hoi, Principal Dr. Hewa Salorin, distinguished teachers and faculty of Tetsu College, relatives and friends of the graduating class of 2023, and to you, future entrepreneurs, future academics, <clears throat> future thinkers, uh, future bureaucrats, future teachers graduating today. As a teacher and a researcher myself, it is both a delight and honor for me to deliver this commencement address in a ceremony that is as solemn and important as this one in the life of a student. <clears throat> and for this, I thank Tetsu College for extending this very warm welcome and hand of invitation 
I, as, as uh, Dr. Ho Hoi has mentioned, I worked at the Department of English in the year 2016 from January to March. And uh, although it was only for a period of three months, I had the pleasure of making some amazing friends and colleagues, um, some of whom I'm still in touch with today. So uh, I was happy to see the, Dr. Kahor, and unfortunately I did not see Anjan, who was supposed to be here. Um, so uh, this convocation, when uh, Dr. Lorin asked me to be the commencement address, uh, first of all, I was thinking, well, it's going to be so hot, I'm not used to the Dimapur heat. <laughs> so, you know, please forgive me if I'm sweating so much profusely because I'm just not used, even if it's an AC, I, need, I think I need to be inside a freezer. So, so, um, so basically, this, you know, I was thinking what this convocation reminds me um, of. And, you know, uh, in the study of anthropology, there is a... In, in the study of especially ritual practice um, and the study of what we call the rites of passage, right? Uh, which is basically a set of practices, ceremonies, observations, or observ observances that any community circumscribes as part of its life system. This rite of passage is a marker of social change of the individuals who are undertaking this rite of passage. So in the past, um, in the Naga society, there were different kinds of rites of passage. We had puberty rituals, we had uh, death rituals, right? Then we had um, marriage, death, certain milestones. As some of you might know, we had the social jena, right? So we had, these are some of the ways through which, you know, social relations were fostered and, you know, social dynamics were mapped. In Lotha society, we had this, um, this feast of merit, and it was called Osho. So where the individual was, was allowed, after performing the first rite of feast of merit, you are allowed to use the red and white shawl, which is called the Pankrab shawl. So while today in Naga society, we do not observe rituals in the strict anthropological sense of the word, this kind of ceremony, like a graduation ceremony, acts and behaves as a kind of initiation from one world to the other world, from the world where you are a student and from now, and you are going to move into another world, right? So this phase that you are in right now, it's what anthropologists would term a liminal phase. A liminal phase of neither here, neither there. It's a space betwixt and between where your identity transformation is taking place. So when you think of this context, you know that whatever it is, you're going to see a change, a change in your identity, because you're no longer students anymore. You're no longer postgraduate students, but now you are going to enter into a world, you will prepare, you're preparing yourself to step out into the world and make yourselves at home in the world. So I take this opportunity to share a few worldly wisdoms that I have absorbed in the various trajectories of my life as a teacher, a scholar, a daughter, a sister and a friend. Uh, these thoughts and ruminations are not meant only for the graduates today, but I hope it will also serve as reminders for the rest of us gathered here today, you know, of the fallibility of human condition, of the human condition, the nature of human desire and ambition, the implications of our choices on ourselves and on others and the complex ways in which, in, especially in a Naga society, how the personal and the social impact and intersect with each other, especially when it comes to making our decisions, right? To begin with, I would like to draw on something that, has been, that I feel is very important to us, even as, um, as individuals or at, um, as teachers or as students. I would like to draw on the wisdom of the late writer George Bernard Shaw, who very succinctly crystallizes one of the philosophies of life as this. Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Many times as we grow older, we become, I'm sure you will also experience this, sometimes I experience this myself, we become very stoic, we become difficult to change, we are very set in our ways, Change, although we, you know, it's, there's a cliche saying that change is the only thing constant. 
And we never sort of internalize this idea of change as being internal and internalized and internalized in ourselves. But we say, oh, change is the only thing constant. We see it as change outside of ourselves, change that is external to us, right? But when we talk about change, when we talk about change, it also it means it also means that we must, as people, must always be open to change. And as we grow older, even I have realized, as I've mentioned, when what I want from life and what life gives to you, sometimes you feel that it's not fair, right? So I'll get to that. For me, this quote rings particularly true. As someone who struggled for some time to truly understand um, and realize what I want from life, and um, balancing it with what life expected from me and what life gave to me. It is ultimately our circumstances, our context, our backgrounds, our, you know, our familial affiliations that will give you the choice to decide what works for you and what works for the people around you. Even today, as I stand before you, I'm not sure if this being in academics is the one great narrative of my life. Or if this is something that I will be doing till my last breath, or if this is, or I might wish to circumvent into something, another different area and maybe do something like writing, let's say. For a lot of my generation, basically, you know, the graduating class of 2007, 2008, when, you know, we, we, have, we have this set mindset that having a traditional, um, traditional, secured government job was the length and breadth of our ambitions, at least for most of us. And why? You, why? Because basically, when you bring it down to the ground level, it provided us what every human being desires in anything, in a relationship, in a finance, in a friendship. What do you most desire? Security, right? So that is something that, especially in my generation, we really craved for it. But the fact is, we, all of us, cannot simply rely on the government on to provide all of jobs for all of us, right? I have seen many friends, brilliant, intelligent friends, and other individuals as well, spending the most fruitful years of their lives um, wasting away and waiting on a government job while, meanwhile, not doing anything else. And that, I think, is an error. I'll tell you why. Because when you are just fixated on, you know, of course, I'm not saying that you should not be focused on your exams if you're applying to go for exams. Yes, there has to be a degree of focus. But also you should, after a certain maybe you know, after a certain time, a point of time, you once you get and in, get involved in other activities as well, you are exposing yourselves to understanding the nitty gritty of human relationships, to work ethics. Trust me, work ethic is not something that is naturally occurring to many of us, and it is the culmination and it's the product of years and years of mental training. And you know, you what what happens is that when you are fixated only on one thing especially in the, in the days of your youth, you lose out on so many capacity and character, personality building experiences. I say this because as I've mentioned uh, five minutes back, as we grow older, we become more stoic, we become much more difficult to change and difficult to adapt to the things around us. But as I mentioned again, this does not mean you should not pursue this, please do, but always be mindful of yourself now, no matter what, keep a plan B and work on it concurrently, side by side. And you will see that along the way, uh, along the way, <clears throat> you, you will see that your CV will carry more weight than someone who has only pursued one thing at one time for a long, prolonged period of time. Psychologists, I think, call this the sunk cost fallacy a mind space we get stuck in when we feel that we have invested too much time, energy, and resources to give up. So we find ourselves in a kind of loop, right? And along the way, we miss out on so much that could have been. Honestly, I can, quite, I can assure you 
that <clears throat> there are no shortcuts to, that will take us to our destination besides hard work and perseverance. At the same time, I also want to add that there is no one set track that will assure contentment, <clears throat> contentment to each and every one of us because each of us are wired different from each other. We have to customize the trajectories of our lives in accordance with our personal context, our struggles, our backgrounds, our educational realities, as well as taking into cognizance something that most of us forget to do, our own limitations. This is also another reason why I feel being too competitive can sometimes dehumanize us. Competition to a healthy degree is fine. And as you enter into a workplace, you will find and you will meet all different, different kinds of people. You know, you will meet the efficient and the adapt, some who are there for the experience, some who are there out of choice, and some for the lack of it, some you will get along with and some you will avoid. And there will also be some with this crabs in a bucket syndrome, which is the idea of if I can't have it, so can't you, right? And this is the reality of the human conditions. There are all types of people around us. But remember that all, everyone, all of us, are just trying to get by and make the most of it. In such situations, once we enter the workplace, it is important for us to just be kind and learn to be happy for each other. That's something this is something very, very important. And I truly believe that once you learn to be happy for someone else, you are the one who gets blessed. And also know how to comfort one another, because as I've mentioned, life is not fair. I spent most of my um, education, edu uh, education, I did most of my education outside Nagaland. I did my schooling in Bangalore. Uh, then I studied my D, my BA in Miranda House, in Delhi University, and then I went for my higher studies in Hyderabad. And now that I'm in Nagaland, I see certain glaring differences, not only in teaching styles, but very importantly, in the nature of studentship and the nature of scholarship in Nagaland. So, <clears throat> I feel that most of us, if you become teachers later on, and I'm sure most of the teachers in this room will agree with me, <clears throat> when we are teaching somebody, we are, it, if we want our society to get better, we have to teach our younger ones not what to think, or, but how to think. That is the foundation on which critical thinking is built. I think that that is something that I've learned over the years because knowledge and information is available anywhere. You open YouTube, you just type postmodernism, it's available, right? I'm sure you must have done that. I've done it myself. Okay, if you want to, if I want to do some refresher, quick five minutes refresher before going to class, I open YouTube and then I just tell you, okay, these are the concepts, right? But beyond the concepts, how to understand them? how to internalize these concepts and how to use it in personality development is something that they will not teach you even in YouTube. So that's why this is where the role of teachers come in. And you as prospective scholars, teachers, leaders of our community should know. Another thing that I want to tell you is that thinking deeply and dwelling on things, when, I, when I'm talking about critical thinking, thinking deeply and dwelling on things is also equally very important. This is not the same as overthinking. Okay, so with there we have a tendency to we have a tendency to sometimes overthink without thinking deeply, right? So once you once you learn to think deeply, your you start developing layers to your personality. <clears throat> In Nagaland, one of the things that I've noticed is that in the classroom, as well in public spaces, we do not have a culture of asking questions. And I think even the teachers would agree with me here. Um, and I thought for a long time, like, why is this happening? Why is, why does nobody, is nobody listening to me in the classroom? Or am I just really boring? Everyone's switched off, you know? So you start thinking, why is nobody asking questions? So you start interacting in seminars and 
uh, workshops still no questions, right? So I'm just, okay, I'm just, I've gotten so used to it. But we do not have a culture of thinking. Uh, sorry, think culture of asking questions. Perhaps I was thinking, where, perhaps where this comes from, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think it stems from our general notion of respect to authority and elders. We as a society tend to subconsciously view them as embodiments of perfection, but we have to realize that they are also fallible that they are also prone to mistakes, and most importantly, they are also just like us and that we are all like each other. Asking the right questions, not simply asking questions in order to be disruptive, but also interrogating and providing critique is a duty, is a duty, as a duty, is a duty to ensure justice and equality in any society. So ask the right questions at the right time without being disruptive. Um, at the beginning of my career, um, after my post-graduation, most of my friends, you know, we started thinking about what are we going to do. We were pretty much in the same space as you. And we had uh, seniors like Hewasa, and they, were, they had started working. I think Hewasa had started working in a magazine, right? And we had friends who had started working in Google, Facebook. Well, and you know they had these. They were started working in these places that have amazing facilities, which I never even imagined would be available in the workspace. But at one point of time, I also wanted. To, I was thinking, well, should I just apply to Google, right? But I wanted to pursue writing, and I did not want to pursue academics. Academics, admittedly, is my second choice. I first wanted to be a journalist and a features writer. Academics was my backup plan, and print journalism was my first priority. I, you know, I was like you, I was young, and uh, I found the world of journalism exciting because it impact, I felt that it impacted real lives on the ground, and thought that academics was far too heavy on theory, and was rather detached from the realities of the world, and you know, uh, it does, and, the, and I thought that the real world issues um, took backstage. And that was the mindset I carried with me into my first profession. So I was working as a correspondent for the Times of India, and I was going here and there doing my work. And <clears throat> however, um, I realized, my, I did not realize my own limitations. So whatever I'm sharing with you today, they are for my own experiences. So then I, I realized that I was not physically capable of being a journalist because being a journalist entailed being on the ground physically all the time, right? You have to chase reports, you have to come back to the office, you have to write the reports, you have to give it to your editor, and then the editor will give it, and then you have to wait till the paper goes in, right? And this is the repeated, and this is on loop every single day at work. So I realized that I was not physically cut out. I started getting sick and sicker, okay? So when I cleared my net, I was decided, okay, let's just give this second uh, choice a uh, shot. Uh, and all this, and you know, when, when I entered academia, I was also entering it in a way with all my dis misconceptions about academics myself. And also because I was young and, you know, I thought at some point, at, at, in some parts, I thought that, oh, academia is, academic is, is, is a bit pretentious, okay? I thought it was not, it did not have the, the, uh, the kind of tangibility that journalism has. So I took, I went with this attitude to academics, and I did my MPhil in war literature, or World War II literature. And um, as I was doing this, I started noticing. I, I you know, I was, I was, I was writing. I, I wrote my thesis on it as, at the same time that I was working. But then I realized that there was a kind of emptiness in me. And I was thinking, I, I felt detached from the subject that I was working on, because it felt like I made a mistake. And back then, in 2009, 2010, we were not much aware about the study of oral traditions a study of, you know, that these studies can, could also be done under the ambit of English studies or cultural studies. 
So only once I got into PhD and started engaging with professors from the minority communities, from the indigenous communities, <clears throat> that I realized the fault in my thinking. While academia still is, and I admit, it is still a bit isolated from the real world, once you start asking the right questions that stem from the community or that stem from the ground and society, you will realize that there is much more that you can do with it. I am reminded of what my mentor, Dolly Kikon, once told me. She said, and, it's, and I hope that you will carry this with you. She said, we have to stop looking at the world in terms of hierarchy, in terms of, oh, he is so-and-so, she is so-and-so, right? If you want a society to really grow, we have to start looking at the world as ideas. Right? I think our Naga history of subjugation, of being historically, socially, and economically backward for so many millennia, has made us look at ourselves and our indigenous systems in a very problematic way, in the sense that we don't have confidence in our own indigenous systems. And that is a win for colonialism. Take, for example, <clears throat> poetry, right? Poetry. Now, the Directorate of School Education is on its way to changing the syllabus of their Indian Studies textbooks. And um, there, is, there is a drive to indigenize syllabus as much as we can. When I use the term poetry, right? We, we say, oh, this is traditional Naga poetry, but the concept of poetry is a Western construct, and we have used it to measure and classify our narrative folk songs or poetry that is there in our, that's there in our uh, indigenous knowledge systems. We are using, so we are calling it lyrical, we are calling it um, elegy, right? But we forget that our own indigenous systems have their own unique classification systems. So take pride in these classification systems. So when we look at poetry in, our, in the Naga context, we have actually poems like uh, verses that are sung. They're not exactly poetry, right? So, don't feel the pressure to adapt so much also to other modes of thinking that you lose your own originality or you, you, lose, you lose seeing the authenticness of your own indigenous cultures. But view our cultures, view your cultures in the light of their own context. Above all, a few gentle reminders to you all. Be mindful of your words. Words are repositories of feelings. Love means so many different things. If I just write the word love in the background today, right now, it will mean a variety of emotions that you feel, right? You have love for your partner, love for your mother, love for your clothes, love for your shoes, love for your pet. Words have a magical potency to influence and impact the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you act. So, you know, people say, uh, I used to see this on uh, YouTube, that there, is this, there are these manifestation affirmations where you look in the mirror and you say, you are smart, you are beautiful, right? So be mindful of your words. Be mindful in the choice of your words. Okay, don't give vent, full vent, to your emotions such as anger, right? Because in anger, we tend to say things that we usually regret. Even if we don't regret the whole thing, we will regret 70% of it. But above all your ambitions, your desire for success, etc. remember, uh, <clears throat> kindness and forgiveness go a long way. If we, and this, it goes a long way, because once you learn to forgive others, once you learn to forgive somebody who has done you wrong in the workplace, you, you do better for yourself, right? 
I want to leave you with one small um, anecdote. If I gave you a piece of cloth today, right? Maybe I give you uh, uh, like 15 by 15, 15 inch piece of cloth. If I gave to everyone today, some of you might just be like, oh, whatever, just put it, leave it here. Some of you may like, okay, let's, I can make it into a scrunchie, right? Or some of you might think, well, just put my hair up with it. Or somebody might just take it home and just make it into like a small uh, bag or maybe a small um, coin bag or something like that. If I just give any one of you a piece of cloth, life is like that. It's all about what you do with what you have at that moment, right? So I want to leave you with this. Thank you to Tetsu College uh, for the time, and thank you uh, very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for that great, uh, for the inspiring speech. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for sharing with us the wonderful insights uh, and the knowledge. I think we have to take a lot from that, both the faculties as well as the students. Um, ma'am, we would be extremely delighted to have you here again if, uh, in the near future. Uh, thank you, ma'am, so much. Uh, now, um, as we end this uh, event, uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee, our principal, uh, our director, uh, the faculties of both departments of political science, uh, English, the HR department, the IT media, uh, the man maintenance department, and all those who have contributed to make this event a success. Uh, thank you all. Uh, so with this, I close the ceremony and for the next one uh, we will ha be having lunch which will be served in the tech square in the boys dining hall.